and then you can shut the April. Yeah. Recording yeah. is on. That'd be good. Yep. Yeah. I have a uh, I have a bunch of file boxes that I slowly fill up and then as they get towards full, I then package them up and truck them off to the storage unit. And and I bought a, a nice small scanner. Pete, you'll remember I was wondering about like getting a scanner or whatever and I got a a small scan snap from Fujitsu. And yep. the, the ScanSep series is very, very nice. They're just like really good scanners. And this little one is a gem and it's kind of astonishing and it like moves very quickly. It's not that small. It's the next size up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and, and yet I find that I need to shift myself into, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to scan something now. Right. Uh, I need to do that even for shredding where yeah. like if i if i have a bunch of stuff i just wait to shred because i don't want to do it in the so moment you have, like, so i gotta be in stack? shred mode yes i do i have a that's stack good. of stuff to shred well, that's the shredder right here also. I, I think that's i think that's standard <laughs> standard practice usually I, I know, get to shredding uh, once a month i know a lot of people who have a you know a little letter size box or so, or you know something where shred stuff accumulates shred stuff i've got this uh that box right there is a is a cool scanner oh. um from caesar it's actually uh, a little camera on a, on a stand and a oh, light like and stuff like that their, their oh, newest one cool. looks really cool it's a combo webcam uh you know drawing on stuff uh streaming cam uh scanner cam oh interesting cool. yeah so you can actually uh, do a demo do demos with it and stuff like that yeah and it folds and you know different ways how like the camera on um, pete you've heard me say this before but the camera this small on my smartphone can take pictures as good as any canon pocket phone i ever carried not as good as the you know canon dslr uh or you know whatever uh mirrorless thing i've got now but but just about and and so and they're cheap as hell too. Like the hardware cost is pretty darn low. And you put one on a stick and and hang it over something, and and you're like, go. It's sort of crazy. Um, let me come back and think about that. I, I've got a local uh, question. Okay. Um, interesting. I mean, like, I know that the Web Archive open sourced a bunch of. Um, their like scanner specs that you could slot a phone into, but you had to keep it like at a particular angle and very steady and have the right lighting and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. All seems like too much to fit inside my New York apartment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, alas. We moved to a, a, a considerably bigger place a year ago and it's a, it's problematic because now we're expanding to fill the space. And <clears throat> that that's just dangerous because when you downsize, the opposite thing has to happen, and then it's hard. Chris. Yeah. This bookshelf came about so I could do all the remote stuff with Zoom for work and have a good background because directly behind that is on one side of me, this side here. Directly behind that is my kitchen, and directly behind there is my bar, all of the bottles of alcohol. So I was like, need to put something in front of it so it doesn't look unprofessional. <laughs> um, but uh, it was good because the books are expanding all around me. And I keep collecting. Yeah, uh, there's yours. Yeah, right out of view. All I have uh, to do is shift the camera a wee little bit. And there's the button. Yeah. Uh, put the flowers in front of it and call it a day. That's right. Not a little camouflage and we're good. Yeah, I uh, I think that uh i keep having to collect up books and shrink the collection that's immediately available to take those to the storage unit too because that tends to overwhelm me i now have another shelf right to the right here that i cannot easily rotate the camera to get to uh but yeah the, always more stuff to read oh nice let me take a look the um the the one i've got i think it is actually a shine um the one in that box up there it's uh, i'm i'm reasonably impressed with the company it's a chinese company um and they've got um, book flattening technology um uh i haven't tried the book flattening technology but i think it would work okay i i ended up trying to use this i think it's a shine for uh, 
for scanning photos. And it goes up to about 200 DPI, 200, actually 250 DPI or something like that. It's not quite good enough. It's also the, the field that, that it scans is evenly lit. Um, although they do have this really cool thing where they've got two sets of lights, uh, the top-down light for stuff that's not super reflective, and then they've got side lights um, for stuff that is reflective. Um, I'm, and Chris, oh, I'm, I'm pretty pretty happy with it, and I'm looking forward to the new one, uh, which is pre-order still. But uh, Chris, we ended up down this path uh, with the ambient boxes in Pete's <laughs> uh, in Pete's video prison. Uh, we started talking about scanning documents and all that kind of stuff. I, I hide them with a virtual background on Zoom. But, but hey, you're among friends. I was I was gonna say I best I've got is like a little you know small card index that I keep on the desk. I you know so I can only be in awe at Peter Kaminsky's collection. <laughs> you know. I, I do I have a thousand pound like. 20 plus drawer card index that I'm refinishing, but it's going to be a while before I can bring that in the house. Library or from where? Uh, it is, I don't think I've dated it yet, but it is probably mid a mid 50 singer. And it is, oh, I actually have a, we can do a little small demo. Go and tell. Oh, they're big. This is, this is the, the thing so it's you know this is a four by six card is it for punch card so it's much bigger than a punch so, card it's but it's also it's it's slightly larger than the old punch card size um which is i mean it's a kind of a punch card shape uh and it also has a weird mechanism in the bottom for the file dividers which was uncommon so, so if you got enough of those to basically stack them up and do an entire wall, would that be the 1900 equivalent of a video wall? Could be roughly, yeah. Kind of? Mm. Mm. I'm just saying, comedically, metaphorically. Think, think of, I, I'm thinking Zettelkasten. <clears throat> well, this is the, I mean, you could do Zettelkasten. You could do Zettelkasten with those index drawers, right? Yeah, I don't think this one was meant for business use, assuredly, be, because it's so large. It was not usually the smaller ones were the two or four drawers that you would put on your, usually not even on your desk. You'd do them on the credenza behind you if you had a small personal collection. Um, so my, there's only a hand, only a handful of academics I've ever seen go past you know eight or ten drawers. At least in my research so my, my favorite paper handling personal story is my first job was at mobile oil before it was exxon mobil in the transportation department and every morning we came in and opened the mail and we would take the fifth revised page 242 and replace the fourth revised page 242 in a tariff from the federal uh the, the icc the interstate commerce commission which which tariff, and then we would put the fourth revised in the back because we had to do audit later and you, you needed to keep every version of every page like a wiki. Um, and, and then the rest of the day would be spent answering the phone as people from wherever called up and said, how much does it cost to move packaged lubricating oils from McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania to Allentown? <clears throat> and you'd be like, what's the product? And you go up and look at the product number and all that. And, and oh, and the file room was rotating file cabinets and like the, the, old, physical, the old physical thing with three ring binders. Very exciting. This, this is kind of like my stint at the HP marketing department as a contractor. Um, it was like 1993 when the web was brand new and uh, I was doing web programming, actually some pretty fancy web, web coding for the marketing department. Um, the marketing department is, was where all the competing factions, you know, the, there were like three or four different, four or five different printer divisions and three or four different scanner divisions. And they, they all hated each other. And all of them were like, you know, so then everybody funneled down to the marketing department and we got to decide, you know, how to how to present printers, you know, like like it was one cohesive product line <laughs> instead of five warring factions. But um, and, and then as as contractors, we were the ones who actually could get stuff done. Uh, the staff was like in meetings literally all day, every day, not not doing anything. But um, 
I'm poking around the internal um, uh, information system and found out that you could just order these uh, reprints of, of articles, you know, technical, you know, internal technical articles on all kinds of like things. So I'm like, you know, I'm like, wow, that looks really cool. And so I put it in my car and then pretty soon I've got a cart full of 20 papers of all kinds of random stuff, right? And I click order and it's like, you just order these things, right? And then they show up in inter-office mail at some point. So like three or four days later, I, I get a visit from the manager who's, you know, I'm, I'm working under and she's like, okay, so it's cool, but who the hell ordered all these random technical articles in the marketing freaking department, right? And it turns out that she had to pay for all of them. Oh, I didn't realize I was wondering that. if there was an interdepartmental charge or something. Yeah. 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 And it wasn't like, you know, it's obviously if you need it, you just order it and, and your manager pays for it. But I was ordering stuff that she did not want to, you know, <laughs> she did not need in the marketing department. But and I felt so embarrassed and so bad. And I offered to pay for them. And she's like, no, 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 it's fine. It's no big deal. You know, but out of my budget, it's not that big of a deal. But it was super fun. That's hilarious. Love that. <laughs> there were there were people who's as who like literally would it was also a massive it used to be an old manufacturing facility in in the heart of silicon valley and it was this massive shop that you would get lost in literally it was like as big as a mall and so you'd like weave your way it took like five minutes to walk from where you parked you know in that end of the building to where you were so you'd walk by all these people there was one guy who literally all day, every day was playing uh, solitaire, whatever, you know, snakes or bombs Mine, or whatever I forget. But it was like, and you could see his, the way it w worked, you could see his. He didn't have boss mode? Like the whole time. No, nah, it's like, whatever, you know, I'm playing, playing my game. Like, okay. Wow. That was weird. Um, what? freedom sorry fellowship of the linky kind of things are on people's minds at this mo at this point um i have a bit of an update on the thinking tools map project. please awesome um and then i i kind of need to leave uh, for another meeting thanks for coming back and sorry about the time and stuff yeah no worries i think we're and the us is because of daylight savings time we're an hour off from the rest of the world right now for this week that might actually be part of the computer. So if, if the time is hosted non-US, yeah. that would, I think, explain it. Uh, so, um, so that project is right now the three of us, Matthew and Bill Anderson and me. Um, and um, we ended up, we've, we've been doing asynchronous collaboration and uh, I don't know. We had I did a big move. Matthew did a big move, and then and then um, Matthew was sick, basically. So we've been kind of um, off. So today at Massive Wiki Wednesday, we had a great uh, kind of get together and got to go through some of the stuff. Um, we figured out uh, a little bit how to distinguish tools and practices as we're um, accepting those and putting them on the wiki and stuff like that. Um, I accidentally talked them into, we want to do a, a card sorting exercise, essentially on um, the dimensions we're talking about of how to judge tools. <clears throat> and my immediate, when I saw, Matthew's got this great table of about 10 things. Um, and when I saw that, it's like, oh, I want to pull this into Airtable and think with it. Use Airtable as a thinking tool to make more of them, judge them, uh, add to them, and things like that. And that seemed like a really natural thing for me to do. Um, uh, so I suggested that. And then Matthew said, well, shouldn't we just do it in the wiki? And then I, I was like, yeah, we should probably do it in the wiki. And But then he got talked into doing it in Airtable. So we're going to do it in Airtable. Um, I'm going to show them how, how to do that next Monday. Um, so there's a meeting I will meeting that we've got scheduled, I will post on the channel uh, to do dimension dimension card sorting uh, in Airtable uh, awesome. as using Airtable as a thinking tool. Thank you. Um, and then we had an interesting kind of side conversation about how you collaborate on wiki pages in the era of wiki plus Git. And so that was cool. But um, maybe I'll write that up someday. Maybe I won't. Uh, so it's going a little slow, which is, I think it's fine. 
um, I will post a link to the page that's got um, the dimensions. I should catch and, up with uh, this, this group and the conversation because I'd love to also like synchronize all of us on the shape of the whole of, of the project. Like, how big does that, anybody think it is? Or... The, the, in, the, in the project plan, I'm, I, don't know if, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. In the project plan, um, we're, we're still in the phase where it's uh, me and Matthew and Bill just trying to orient ourselves enough to be able to come to the Fellowship of the Link team and say, oh, look, we've got this little baby that maybe now we could like, you know, grow it up. Um, so we're, we're, we're like pregnant with possibility more than we have an actual baby. Um, uh, but so it's, it, in some ways, it's a little early. Um, so this is, uh, we have it on a random, totally random, uh, literally totally random uh, domain right now, but this is the a page in the wiki with the dimensions that we're working on. Um, and then let me grab the calendar event for next week. And it's if you it's don't please don't have FOMO for this. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, Wow, that's an ugly link. Oh, maybe maybe while I'm maybe a bit of patter while I'm uh, swapping links around. Uh, I'm also right now working on some code that parses Zoom chat files, um, and there's a different couple different formats for that. So it's not. It's it's funny. It's taken me hours and hours and hours, and then I'm always feel embarrassed that it's taken hours and hours and hours. But it actually. <laughs> Everything does now. <laughs> there's there's these weird kind of corner cases where uh, line endings are different. Um, they use they, sometimes they use a, a character, a Unicode character called line separator, um, hex twenty eighty or something like that twenty twenty eight, um, and it's hard to see. And if it if you bump into it, you know it's not it's not obvious why you bumped into it. Kind of um, so anyway. Um, so this is the meeting on Monday, um, and again, Given, it's... Yeah. I, my first impression of M Matthew's Maiden Martyr draft mm -hmm. is that he's got some good stuff, but I think probably one of the things that would be most useful for pushing part of the agenda that we're all hoping for is his openness axis is too dense by a magnitude. And I, th so there's kind of openness as you talk about, you know, free and open source stuff and APIs and import and export. But I think if you pull out open standards as a separate item or a separate access, yeah. Uh, you'll get a lot further, a lot farther. And I love that it's high up and one of the first things on the table, which then kind of gives it that, you know, extra, hit, or at least in this presentation, depending on how you present it, it may change the shape of what that data looks like. But I think yep. by saying there are, progressive sets of standards that we're trying to support here so that my tool will interoperate with every other tool focusing on that as the th the thing because a lot of developers particularly developers will look at this as a checkbox exercise how many of these can i check the boxes on and they'll check the easy ones and the hard one is supporting the standards so that the data you put into my tool will work with 10 other tools. And yep. that's the harder problem. And it's the problem no one wants to play with, no one work, wants to work on. There's no glory in having the best standard or the best support standards, which is how you end up with siloed data and communities and all the rest. Um, 
So I think I, just I, breaking I, that one thing out, like yeah, well, that's, that's a really good one. And maybe I'll go back to the recording and and try to take some of that wisdom and move it into move it into that page or the the collaboration around that page. I I think the 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 one thing is that the the group here and there's a few others that I'm in uh, flotilla for one where we actually judge judge fitness and and beauty uh, with the amount of interoperability we have rather than the other way around right so um, there is it's small right now it's a, a few folks like us but there is a movement to be interoperable rather than you know making sure that you get more boxes ticked or something like that i mean i if there's so if, i i attribute it more to having done work with tantek chelik you know you need to have a yeah. tool that you actually use and if you're not using it then it's a total loss a yeah. lot of people go out hey i'm going to build this great tool for the masses but they don't even use it themselves and it's yeah and, and usually it re results in the thing suffers from UI because you're not actually you know, sort of self dog fooding it, which is yep. not the greatest metaphor, but you know, is that thing. And then second, can I, can I build it so that it will work with other things? Yep. Um, or those two kind of together at the same time become the two big axes. And then all the rest are nice to have beyond and and going past so I, another thing to note um with the dimensions uh -huh. is matthew's very keen on ending up using a minimum number of them um like six or eight uh something that would be useful for a newbie and also something that would be like visually easy to represent on a spider graph um, or a radar map spider graph um, rather than so I, th I think there's going to be a tension I, I can I can kind of imagine for some of us we'd really be interested in you know 20 or 30 you know dimensions of a tool um, with a lot of fine grain detail and Matthew's pushing the other way we want to maybe not densify but at, but at least kind of coalesce things that aren't important to you know uh, anybody who's not a specialist so just something to, to think about and not well or the you know use the Pareto principle what are the yeah, yeah. what are the 20 percent of the things that are going to get you most of the way there that and particularly ones that people don't think about or put the importance on a lot of the other kind of must-haves are features that you can fall off a turnip truck and have in a product. And most people will because they're the easy things that you don't have to put the thought into. So it's what are the things they're not going to think about that are a little harder to do, but that are more necessary yeah. and focus on those and then just leave the rest because they'll handle themselves. Yeah. Um, folks, I apologize, but because of the way the timing works this week, I, I need to take off to another meeting. Thank you. So. And Pete, you explained what happened to my calendar perfectly. It was the time zone yeah. difference. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, and I, didn't, I didn't check this brain to actually double check that the time was funny and shifted. Uh, so next week, it's back at 11 Pacific, which is great. And then uh, is Matthew feeling better? Is he? Matthew is feeling better, yeah. Okay. Not 100%, but he's, he's very good yeah, at this point. Cool. Thank you. And thanks, thanks for asking. For, thanks for coming back. Yeah. Cheers all. Cheers. See you around. This is you over there. I do think there might be something interesting to talk about in all of this movement over to just this this talk of like use it yourself first and then interoperability. It reminds me that so much of I think onboarding users requires that if we have a level of interoperability, right? Like the best way to get users is for it to easily integrate into what they're already doing. Uh, I don't know. It, it all of the um, people onboarding onto Mastodon this week. It's an interesting to see a bunch of tools pop up that are like, we're gonna you sync your Mastodon and Twitter account, and then hope everybody else syncs their Mastodon and Twitter account, and that pulls it up. Or I found one that was like, we're gonna scan everyone you follow to see if they've tweeted an at at 
like regex structure or have changed that to their profile it's just interesting to see these very weird ways that people sort of are pulling on i don't know i don't know if there's a better one right like theoretically you sign on with twitter but that would negate some of the point <laughs> yeah yeah and it's, it's funny because mastodon is a Im very imperfect substitute for twitter for a bunch of different reasons and the community like there's a whole bunch of people scratching their heads going do i really want to go there is it working what how does it work what am i doing and there aren't that many other good options out there it's weird yeah i, I mean i think it Oh, go ahead, Chris. I find some of the small, subtle social cues to be even interesting. So it's, we we don't do these patterns on this platform or this platform doesn't do these things and that's a good thing because X. And it's more about we're here to make kind of a friendly, more happy place. So, you know, essentially it's an adjust your expectations and enjoy this happier space because of it. And I see an awful lot of that. So even things like in micro dot blog, people saying, you know, there's no algorithmic feed here. There's no likes and no retweets. So if you want to tell somebody you really love their post, you physically have to type it out and, and, you know, be a person and reply to them rather than just send them this like smallest phatic symbol of nothing. <laughs> But yeah, I think it's go ahead. sorry, go ahead. Right, okay, yeah, I think it's partially like these things do not perfectly map to each other, and where you're seeing the friction in people to, who are adopting and unsure what's going on, the friction comes out of um, the, the spaces where the maps don't match up, right? Like, a really good thing is an example of something like the local that I see some of people are very often confused about, right? Where, why does this show up in a local? Why does this get amplified? Why is this person available in my search and this person isn't? Why do hashtags not search across all instances? Um, whereas like some people are going to come in and see that as a, I don't understand, this is confusing. And some people are like, well, that's a feature, not a bug, right? And some things, it, it's interesting because I think like what unlocked using Mastodon in many ways for me was the realization that one, don't be on the main instance. That's bad. Like the main instance is bad. You're not going to get what you want out of it because the instances are designed more to be like a Twitter local or sorry, not a Twitter local. The instances local is designed to be more like a Twitter list, right? So like you want to be a main on one instance, but also you really want to lurk on a bunch of other instances, right? Like I have the main instance I'm on and then I'm on like an artsy instance where I have absolutely nothing to contribute, but I like seeing the art. And then I'm like also on um, like a, a socialist instance where it's people talking politics and like the rules for talking politics there very different than the rules talking politics on some of these other instances and that's intentional um co collectiva that social is the one that i'm on um lurking um i think that's how it's pronounced but uh yeah and like that's sort of the secret to unlocking like twitter the algorithm sort of makes lists for you, right? Where you're seeing a subset of the people that you want to follow and the people that they follow and they engage with and amplify um, on your feed naturally because the algorithm sort of caters it. But I think the, the thing that people have the most trouble understanding with Mastodon is, no, no, not uh, here. Let me get the right URL. Um, the thing that I think most people have the trouble understanding on Mastodon is that, like, it's not just that you can't cater it; it's that the point is to fracture into lists, to fracture into um, instead of lists, instances, right? Like, the the minute the instance gets too large, it becomes less useful and a worse experience, which is why mastodon.social is the worst instance. 
Yeah, it makes sense. I, I think there's also like a difference between like um, a mastodon and activity path, right? Like uh, apparently, you know, so mastodon is actually quite conservative in my experience when it comes to embedding features. And they have pushed a lot against like any kind of algorithm, uh, algorithmic feeds, which is not the case for Imperoma, I think, for example. Uh, and uh, it, to some extent, uh, I think in, in I mean, oh, everything you're saying is, is correct for Mastodon, but it, that's only Mastodon, I think. So that's the, the that's the other realization, which is like, I think the favors can fit both or like presumably all uh, preferences in that sense. And also there's right. the Blue Sky proto Protocol, which uh, which is Twitter people basically trying yeah. to invent an, uh, a, a, pro a protocol to open source Twitter exchange across any kind of tool, which is a very interesting thing, but the people doing it are sort of the wrong people. It's kind of weird. Uh, and there's a well, coming there's a coming soon well, you know thing you can sign up to be to be told when it's available, but who knows when it's going to be available because this would be the perfect moment for it to be available. Right, but I don't think it really is intended to be that, right? Like they didn't hire the right people to do that, and the current version of the protocol does not appear intended to do that. It's something else. Like one of the lead developers there is the person who built Hyper and DAP, right? Uh, yes. Paul so, yeah, Paul Frizi. Um, yeah, and that's not a Twitter, right? Like you could do Twitter on it. But that's an after effect of the intention of the system, which is I'm very interested in Blue Sky and I'm very interested in exploring the protocol. I have to like set aside time to do it. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, what, what happened there, I don't know, you know, do you, do you check out when it was around Citizen? Yeah, and yeah. No, I followed that very closely. I thought it was very interesting. I mean, once again, like not really Twitter in the same no, way that Mastodon is not really Twitter. That was so weird there because you know when I saw it and knowing that Paul Frosty was um, who I met, uh, we had that call uh, one year ago or so. Um, I was super excited about Citizen, and like people got really excited about Citizen, and then he essentially uh, seemed to uh, lose interest. He wasn't inter interested in like actually driving the proof of concept of like you know what an alternative to Twitter could be like. He was more interested in like a protocol level uh, things. And at some point he was like, "Yeah, I learned all I needed. It was an experiment, so he just shut it down." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I, I, yeah, it was weird uh, seeing that. Right. So, I think. Like, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. I was going to say, I think like Citizen, like a bunch of the other projects, because like he also shut down. I mean, he didn't really shut down, but basically stopped Beaker development round. on the Beaker, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like. I think for him, he was interested in using these to understand how protocols like this could be used. Like I, I read his blog, he did this great series about like why decentralization not too long ago. Um, I can pull that up and add the link real quick. Um, but like, I think it's really interesting in the sense of like what he's trying to figure out is like, how do I start from zero and build back up? towards the products that people want with different assumptions and that's why i think of blue sky as well like i thought of this even before he got more involved it's very clear that blue sky is heavily inspired by like hyper dat whatever we want to call it um but like it's clearly like okay you want something that ends up fulfilling the same product space as twitter but what if we make none of the same assumptions to get there? What if we start mm -hmm. from a clean slate? And it seemed to me like I followed this in development because I was very interested in how he was doing the development, not because I thought it was going to be a finished product, because it was very clear to me that that was what he was trying to figure out, right? Like, mm -hmm. what if it's something else, right? Like, what if our underlying systems are different and our top is the same this sort of actually it's interesting because this is sort of back to what i was saying earlier right like it's the interoperability question you want to create something that what people are already on and used to they can use but if you build the underlying technology very differently you can yeah, move yeah. them towards something else completely yeah yeah so sort of like a stop gap or bridge so um, is there is there a good answer here right now like like given that given that the presenting problem is OMG, Twitter was taken over by Martians. 
mm-hmm. um, or at least wannabe Martians. I think that's actually a good joke. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> like, like, uh, is there any kind of good solution here? Because like, activity pub is overbuilt, is what I've heard from programmers. But yeah. like, there's a whole bunch of things that are close, but not quite even a good replacement, which is astonishing given that it's just Twitter we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's an interesting, it's a very good question. I think ActivityPub is the best we have, even though it has limitations. And it is sort of like in in practice, sort of like, so very often it means Mastodon, but even though it's a particular implementation with its own limitations that yeah. we're discussing. Um, so I'm, I'm not aware of anything that is as uh, as close to like letting uh, users get like a similar user experience. Yes. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, I think it could be scaled probably, but I and that's one thing that uh, and you know like to some extent, you know there's this joke right in Silicon Valley I guess which is like everybody can build Twitter in a weekend. I mean, my, model all the things that make it interesting, yeah. like, you know, like a uh, hundred millions of users and so on, uh, and being like there in, at the right time to actually be able to like, ramp up to that. Uh, so what I actually, I, I had a few conversations with uh, with um, uh, Gargaron, you know, the Amazon lead developer, and now there's like a co-developer and, you know, like uh, she seems very, very, very cool. But like, in general, like I'm, I'm personally a bit disappointed with Mastodon just because it doesn't seem to be pushing the envelope much, and uh, and it and and it has this anti, this pattern where like the features are like lack of features. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which I I can understand why a lot of people want that. Uh, your Twitter is five hundred nine. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, you seem to beam in there for a sec, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 My, I, my camera is doing weird stuff. I don't know what it is. Or oh, why. I thought you were just rematerializing from the another yeah, dimension. Yeah, yeah, from somewhere. Um, but I don't think it's enough to just be able to say like, oh, our feature is that we don't have features. Um, and, you know, to some extent, you know, for example, like algorithmic feed, for me, algorithmic feed is like, it's not good or bad. It depends on the algorithm, no? This is something that, you know, uh, but I found that a lot of the people that are uh, I, I interact with in the in the favors have this appearing uh, negative. Algorithmic is what Twitter and Facebook are doing. Yeah. And that's just like forsaking, you know, like forsaking the tools of humanity to corporations. Yeah. I feel. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And like, I think the thing is, of course, right? Like, you could build something very different on Activity Pub that takes the Mastodon metaphor and runs with it in interesting ways. In fact, there's like a really interesting, uh, what the hell is this platform called that I can't remember, where it's like act, where it's like Mastodon, but it's also extremely different in terms of how it works from Mastodon. Hmm. Uh, Let me see if I can- uh, I'm gonna- Lemmy is like, you know, have you seen Lemmy? Identica- Giant. Maybe that's it. Which one? It, I can't figure Le- out Le- which, is, what platform Le- it is. Lemmy is distributed to, distributed to Reddit. Oh. No, no, like it's still. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I mean, I, I think that shows the, the potential of activity about. Yes, Miski. That, you know, that's it. Oh yeah, yeah, Miski. Yes, yes. I think that's this is the one that is Japanese. Wait, where where did Miski get typed in the chat? <laughs> uh, I I just found it oh, there looking through the code. Um, I will pull it up. I think it's mostly Japanese, but it's been adapted. It's been adopted yes. by different yeah. groups. Like one of my, I have an account on a Miski instance that's specifically like uh, just art people that evolved from people who are passionate about. I I think evolved from people who are passionate about like anime stuff, but it's really just general art now. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. And I find like this is the point, right? Like you could build on top of it. The question is, how do you and what do you bring it? I had a really interesting conversation about like advertising um, recently, which is like the Mastodon lead is super anti-advertising, right? Mm -hmm. And he sees not having advertising on Mastodon as like a, a, once again, like algorithms, it's a feature, not a bug. But... Yeah, I don't necessarily agree, right? Because 
in theory, the way that he imagines and that other people imagine Mastodon organizing is what I sa said earlier, right? Essentially, once your interest group gets large enough, you split off into a different instance. But in actuality, there's going to be centralized entry points like Mastodon.social. Yeah. And the ability for anyone to scale them is very restrictive because things cost money, right? Um, and it would be nice if we thought, like, it, there was a really good video that came out over the week, I think over the weekend, that's it, the top of that Twitter thread um, about spam. And the conclusion that I came to watching it is that, like, advertising is the colonizing force of capitalism hmm. in internet spaces, right? Almost every internet space starts with the same sort of thinking that Mastodon does, which is, oh, everyone's going to share resources. We're all going to contribute. It's going to be small. We'll have a lot of control um, and people will sort of self-moderate. But inevitably, either it fails because it's built on somebody's personal interest and they lose interest, or it's built on somebody's personal budget and they can't afford it anymore. Yes. Or, or it gets advertising. Yes, <laughs> you get advertising or the fourth option, a co-op. So I have here how to pitch it. I'm a social co-op uh, admin. Um, and we run the instance, we're about like 1.5K users. So it's not huge, uh, but it's like a slow growth instance. And and this and here we go back to uh, I think like uh, so I, I I'm a huge believer in co-ops because I want to believe essentially mm -hmm. like you know bias check, uh, but that that's the the other option right because you know like just piggybacking you know the social co-op uh, has a suggested donation of like one buck a year, essentially, uh, and we make do we we have extra money essentially, um, so that could be essentially like the community funding without going to advertising. Although I recognize that, you know, the advertising option, it does seem, I mean, you know, I work for an advertising company. So yeah, <laughs> I, mean, it is. I, I think it's not just that though. Like, I like the idea of a co-op co -op, and I think like there's attempts to push in that direction, right? I think sort of like the big one, yeah. The big one is um, like Pinboard is sort of, the best example of this, right? Where every person who joins pays money and each right. new joiner pays a little bit more money as the cost goes up. Um, but the the downside of it is at the end of the day, it's still dependent on a much smaller group of code and infrastructure maintenance contributors. Mm -hmm. um, like it can't just be paying in in that situation. Whereas like, the and, and the problem is there are people who could potentially contribute, but onboarding them is blocked by them having to pay. Whereas like the thing that advertising enables yeah. is the ability to payment. do the inverse, right? You could pay out to people to have right. to who are interested in contributing. Completely. Uh, Completely. Right. Cause like this is the thing that I have a problem with, because there's a big conversation about data co-ops in the ad space, right? The problem is that a co-op is not just about what you put in in monetary form, but what you put in is work as well. And a lot of the, and, and even more so, like true cooperatives um, are more like unions, right? That's the other model for a cooperative organization. And there, it also is about controlling the, con the controlling how you get compensated and controlling the conditions of your labor. Uh, and that gets into like some really interesting, like I have a very long essay that I'm trying to figure out about this, which is like our interactions with social media inevitably become labor the minute that an algorithm is involved. Hmm. Go ahead, Jerry. Um, so I love what you're talking about. Um, and I have, I have a, some vestigial memories. There's a, there's a book uh, about the, Quakers, I think, uh, called Quakers, Money and Morals. And I think a piece of what it talks about is uh, actually I'm thinking about another, another book called Traveling Brothers, uh, which talks about guilds. And it's a nice history of how guilds worked and what it was like to be on tramp. And there's a bunch of things I can say from there. 
But there's this moment where the industrial revolution starts to hit, and, and in fact, the enclosure movements start to hit, <clears throat> and in and sort of the early capitalists realize they need to take apart the guild system. They need to undermine it. So they so they begin taking actions that destroy the pyramid of how guilds sort of worked, uh, which was the slow progression of you know you get a, a apprentice yeoman master kind of thing. Everybody knows that the the etymology of the term masterpiece is that was the the thing that that a, a yeoman had to create in order to become a master. So if you were in the furrier's guild, you had to make a beautiful fur coat or whatever, and that was your masterpiece. That that was your PhD thesis, basically, to become a master. So there's, this, so there's this very interesting shift from guilds to unions, and then there's a lot of union labor union history that I don't know that is the reason why the, the right hates and demonizes unions, but unions are a defense mechanism against capitalism, which colonizes everything. Aram, I love the statement you just made. I, I wrote it in the chat just to remember it, and I put it in my brain. Because <clears throat> capitalism steps in and like, sharing economy, what a great idea, let's do that. And then like, hey, a bunch of VCs pour a bunch of money into uh, Uber, which is a predator in this field, and, and basically undermine and eat the whole notion of the sharing economy, creating a slave labor camp for people who have a car in some weird right. way, um, and have no say over pricing over anything else. And the poor little you know, taxi co-ops or radio co-ops that try to stand up an app and compete with them, get no attention, have no play, go, you know, go no place. And then there's this other interesting thing that we used to have a lot of mutual aid societies. And, and so insurance comes out of mutual aid and cooperatives that come out of mutual, a whole bunch of stuff started with people just saying, hey, how do we pool some money for risk and how do we help each other when things are bad? And that thread happens in parallel to this other thing about guild and unions. And, and what, what, it, what it feels like we're doing right now is we're trying to find our way back to some of the good nuggets that existed in those early things. Like, hey, apprenticeships are really cool. Guilds had apprenticeships. You know, the, the, mutual aid is really cool. Why don't we sort of figure out how to do that? And now we have these weird techie platforms that are all trying to reinvent how society works. And the crypto people are like, oh, we got this. We're just going to create a cryptocurrency. We're going to put up a big dashboard uh, of projects and everybody's going to vote with their crypto and earn crypto. And, you know, we got this. It's just a marketplace because markets are perfect because we're all libertarians here. And, and, and I'm like, that just ain't going to work. Right. Because that, that's somehow yeah. it's, it's somehow ignorant about human nature and the complexity of projects and the commons and a bunch of other things where it fails. Yeah. So so part of what I'm trying to figure out here is, OK, great. So what are the platforms and protocols that we're going to take for granted 100 years from now? Because I think that they're based on these old things. If yeah, was, and I think that's a really on the conversation. You know, I think that's a really good point. And that sort of gets to like what I was thinking in that Twitter thread about ads, which is that like the way to get back to these things that are in, like that type of model is intrinsically anti-capitalist. And so if you want to return to it, like you can't half measure to that. Inevitably, either you go to some form of revolution or it is defeated by capitalism. Um, and I think the model that a lot of these internet projects take is that we're going to defeat capitalism from zero. Like that's that's what we're going to do. But the problem yes. I have with it, right, it, besides that being very difficult, like I said, I, I said this in the thread, right? Like, I would love to kick off the revolution tomorrow on Mastodon. Let's do it. But that's not realistically going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the alternative in my mind is there's a really good book about um, unions, modern unions, by... Um, uh, I can't remember her name. I'll look it up after I'm done talking. But like, she talks a little bit about this and I don't think it's really sort of the topic she was trying to get into. But as I'm reading it, I'm thinking about this more and more, which is that you can't get to the revolution that you want in these spaces until people feel safe. Um, and to get people safe, you need to have an intermediate step, right? So like you need the, and that's what I was thinking about advertising, right? Like if you don't, if you don't create a situation where you're creating safe, private, 
privacy friendly, non surveillance versions of advertising that can allow people to host these things more easily, make money off of hosting these things and make a living, then they'll never get to the point where they can be capable of contributing to a revolutionary movement. Um, and like, it, if you don't create that step, inevitably the bad version, the worst version of advertising will colonize that space. So, and this is where like, I am going into a space where I need to think more about it and you probably need to read more about it, right? Me too. But, uh, but, these, but you're digging in exactly the right place. This is one yes. of right. But, like it needs to be an anti-imperialism approach. And I don't know enough about that to understand what are the successful tactics there, right? Like there, I did some reading up and like, there's this idea of like targets of imperialism saying we're going to create our own sort of legal system in order to say, no, you can't come in here. You have to, we have rules. Um, and I, I don't know how successful it is or how common that is, right? But like, that's the thing that, I am thinking sort of tours, which is like, if the space, if we want these spaces to not be colonized or disrupted by capitalism, then you need to create sort of a, a, a rule set that protects against it. And, uh, or a defense yeah. mechanism that, that causes capitalism's attempt to take over, to backfire or something like that. I mean, <clears throat> you know, um, I, I think about pufferfish really often or, or, or to toads that have poisonous yuck on their backs because yes. they're kind of slow moving except when they jump. But when, when anything else eats them, it's really unpleasant. So um, it completely, yes, like offensive mechanism. For me, like the, it, it, this course is amazing, by the way. I would, love, I would love to have like, I have to go in two minutes because I have a war meeting. I'm still at work, by the way. <laughs> but like, I'm, uh, this is like, this is one of my favorite topics. And I love what you're saying, Aram and, and Jerry, all these other, uh, this, this, point of the books this to me this conversation leads into the commons as perhaps the the level of organism that can actually develop these defenses and then you know there's a, this vocabulary for example like enclosure of the commons which i see as you know like uh, and, and and the study of of how to uh, prevent enclosure that i think goes very much in this direction and uh, yes and i and i think that uh, advertisement it's like sort of like the you know uh, tapping into that seems like a bit like uh cutting open an artery you know of capitalism <laughs> and drinking his blood which now this <laughs> metaphor is very very weak but, but, uh, young people's blood or suddenly we're in a q and on plot <laughs> right right um, uh, but you know what uh yes promising i will have to say oh fight like hell okay good because i put a book about unions in the in the chat uh which is apparently oh. not the right not the right one um, I, mean, so, I don't, that might, might be good too. I don't know it. And I haven't read the <laughs> other one that I put in the chat. I just had it in my brain. <clears throat> okay. I like tell the untold history of American labor. It looks really cool. Uh, Flancian, yeah. really nice to see you. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, no, sorry. I was late there. I was here. Yeah, work. Uh, yeah, so nice. And next uh, another week on the right time. time. Mystery solved. Um, <laughs> man, that was, that was funny. Uh, mystery solved which one? oh yeah the, the so time he, thing yeah, so yeah, he yeah. showed up at 11 pacific going where is it yeah yeah and i had, I, and I, had a, oh, I already like had an issue with social call meeting earlier in the week yeah yeah it's like uh but it's it's nice some chaos damn some time zones yeah. but my favorite reminder of it i there's a picture that i saw of some archaeologist at stonehenge doing some digging work and somebody recaptioned it as yeah. Our engineers at Stonehenge yeah. are, you know, moving the stones to leave British summertime. It's going to be held, it's going to be held totally for, for, for yeah for uh, daylight savings. Okay, so very nice seeing you. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, yeah, God, yes. you. Know later. See you. I'm adding "Fight Like Hell" to my brain. Oh, it's a very recent book, 2022. Yeah, um, the author uh, Kim Kelly um, got the contract off of some really great coverage she did for Teen Vogue on unionization. Why is Teen Vogue uh, so unexpectedly good? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, well, I think it, it's because there is space to do revolutionary thinking because there are young people who have no preconceived assumptions oh. um, is the answer. Um, but 
that and yeah. somebody having the money and the editorial bandwidth to try and pull it off. Yeah. Yeah, um, that too, which that maybe they have less of now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's... I think it's very interesting to think through what the defensive measures are yeah. that give us safety. And, and this is the place where I am like least qualified, have the least knowledge at all, right? Like I, I couldn't tell you who has successfully executed an anti-imperialist strategy. Um, maybe I'll, I'll give you a, an I can give you I can give you an example of a space you can look for to see the shift socially and culturally. So mm -hmm. um and I think I have it on the orange book up here behind me is um uh David Graver and David Wengrow's book, The Dawn of everything. History. The Dawn of Everything. Uh, the Dawn of Everything. Um unless they wrote a second one that I don't know about. And it, well, that was supposed to be part of a series of three and Graber didn't live long enough. Yeah, I think they get to the next two, um, but I'm hoping Wengro will have the research and be able to pull it off. Um, but essentially, they look at our modern idea, the modern American idea of freedom and liberty, and they trace it back historically, <clears throat> and it really comes from Indigenous Americans and thinkers who left America and went to Britain and France and had conversations about how their societies were structured. And all these enlightenment thinkers saw and read and interacted with them and wrote about how can we throw off our imperial owners and reshape ourselves more like these indigenous peoples and their societies and cultures. And they took bits of the, those ideas and formed a revolution and America took that up. And a lot of it went essentially through writings of travel logs that people in Europe owned and read and had in their homes. And it kind of slowly seeped in. And then the US threw off Britain using war and then shortly thereafter, the French did the same thing. Part of the issue is they they only took certain chunks of that information and knowledge and subsumed it and didn't subsume the entirety of the rest of the indigenous cultures that were saying, here's how we do it. And so we're left with kind of an in-between space between that old imperial world and a new kind of capitalist one um so the, the you know you can look at that as a model of how was it done <clears throat> how did it happen and you know people obviously the rich americans were unhappy with the status quo and the rights they weren't getting mm -hmm. compared to the the, the british people <clears throat> who got better representation or some semblance of representation so you know the, but the tough part is that's you, re, you also require a big sea change of a lot of people being unhappy and at least enough of them willing to jump at have something and have something to move to so it may you know it may take s small revolutions to get everyone to move to something like a, a mastodon or yeah. You know, I, the indie web space is great and a lot of it works, 